Good morning, everyone, again. You had a good week? This is the first day of the week, right? So we're just getting started. So we finished going through the book of Hebrews. Who knows what book comes after Hebrews? Shout it out at me. James, right? You knew that. You knew that. And so I thought, well, James is always good. The first chapter deals with, with trials that none of us are exempt from trials, right? It's like if you're not in a trial now, you know that you can enjoy. Because we live in a world that has fallen, that has an enemy that wants to destroy us, and because sin entered the picture, we have sickness, we have disease, we have pain, we have sorrow. Jesus came into this world to seek and to save the lost, and to give us a life that would be a part. We can come out amongst that dreadfulness and the weight and the cares of the world. Jesus has called us to walk with him. Jesus is not going to keep us from trials, but keep us in the trial. Trials will come, but the Lord is with you. The difference is how we respond. Do I look to the Lord in my trial, or do I try to figure it out on my own? And that's where it gets to be tough. So why is there so much trouble? How many know there's trouble in the world? How many had some trouble last week, somewhere, some along the way? Something happened. Why so much trouble? Jesus said these words, Do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Interesting. Even Jesus experienced trouble. As soon as he was praying and fasting, the troublemaker came along, right? Prior to his earthly ministry, Satan came to Jesus to tempt him if he could and get him persuade him to go another direction. But every time Jesus was able to push Satan away, it was through the word of God. It is written. It is written. It is written. Satan knows a lot about the word of God. And he will try to use it to twist it if he can and get you to think partial truth is some of the truth. Jesus walked on this earth and he overcame. I love how 1 John says Jesus came into the world to destroy the works of the devil. I just love that. Just destroy the works of the devil. He can thwart his plans. He can intervene in, in wars. He can intervene. He has done it before. God is sovereign. And the people of God are praying. God is saying, yes, I will come. So our text is James chapter 1. I'll call it Consider It All Joy, and this is going to deal with trials. Now you're wondering why, how, the scripture is quite interesting at times. James, verse 2, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, he didn't say if you encounter various trials. He didn't say if someday. He said when you 
when you encounter various trials, verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you ask, lacks wisdom. Let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. But let not that man expect he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man and stable in all his ways. But let the brother of humble circumstances glory in his high position. Let the rich man glory in his humiliation. Because like flowering grass, he will pass away for the sun rise with a scorching when withers the grass. And we see this come. Seasons come and go. Seasons come and go in your spiritual life. Seasons come and go in your, in your, your home life. Seemed like it was a whole lot easier sometime when the kids were all little and at the home. And you think back, oh, my goodness, how did I make it through them days? But you never stop caring for your children. You may not have them in your house forever, and that's probably a good thing. But, but you never stop caring. You go from caring for them to caring about them. And you keep, they keep you seeking. One of the, uh, I think sometimes it can be a pitfall or a trap or a, something we've got to be aware of that I want to protect my children. And I, I don't want to see them go through the trial. I don't want to see them get hurt. I don't want to see them have to suffer. But at the same time, it's, it's not a perfect world. And for, in order for them to grow in their faith, they also will go through trial. And sometimes it's a stepping away and say, Lord, help them to look to you. And you may offer advice and you could be a support and you love on them no matter what. But God is ultimately in control of working out their life, and working out their salvation as well. And so, how do I respond in trial? Number one, our pers my perspective, my, my attitude, and my attitude, and my attitude. One of the things that I believe believers struggle with is that why now, Lord? Or why me? What have I done wrong? And you may not have done anything wrong. It's the fact that you live in a fallen world. And stuff happens. And so... What should be my response, or what could be my response? Consider it all joy, according to James, verse 2. When you encounter various trials, now he says various, and every trial is le legitimate. If it's your trial, it's, it's yours. And one can't say, well, yeah, I know just how you feel if they've never been in a similar situation. <laughs> and to relate to other people in their trials. But isn't it interesting that the trials that you and I go through sometimes can be a comfort to someone else if they saw and you demonstrated how you were able to get through that trial. And it brought glory to God, perspective of trials. Philippians 4, verse 4 and 5 says these words, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. I think one of the key things while we're in a trial is to look up and praise God. In the trial, if the trial is helping us look to the Lord, then something good is going to happen. If the trial is causing me to be stretched in my faith, then something good is happening. How can I consider it all joy? I must look past the trial and see the purposes. If God has something that we cannot see now, that we have to, by faith, say, 
It is in the hands of God. God is using this trial to strengthen our faith. Rejoice in the Lord always. I know of a person that told me this story. This is an old-time friend. Their house burned down. He knew it before the wife knew it. And he went to his wife and said, I want you to start to praise the Lord. And then he followed up with the news, our house is burnt to the ground. Well, there's always one couple ways to look at it. With the tragedy to lose everything, your possessions. But if your life is spared, you can give God the glory. Right? It could always be worse. We have a friend who fell off a roof this week and busted up his face and ribs and arms. But the wife, amazing, could have been worse. She could have been paralyzed, you know, on and on. My attitude. I'm not saying that your trial is. That we should never say, well, get over it, or, you know, that's no big deal. We should never say that. We should bear one another's burdens and be sincere about it praying and supporting. But there's something about knowing that there are people around you and in your life that are offering up your deeds before the Lord, that are standing in the gap or interceding on your behalf. There's something about knowing that there's someone else that they have endured much in their lifetime and they have learned the power of praise the power of giving God the glory anyway in spite of the trial, in spite if even they don't feel like it. One of the keys, I think, to the kingdom of God is to praise God whether you feel like it or not until you feel like it. There's something that happens. You see, our, our natural man, our spiritual man, have a wrestling match going on. You and I all, all understand that as Paul talked about it in Romans, it was just knowing what I need to be doing, but struggling to do it. And so there's this battle going on, and praise is one of the things I believe that helps put our natural man in submission to the spiritual man, which is where Jesus wants to dwell within. So the psalmist cries this, I will bless the Lord at all times. I will bless the Lord at all times. Oh, I will only bless the Lord if I feel like it. How is that working for you? When I don't feel like it, then it's when I really need to praise the Lord until I feel like it. We say, what, what do you mean? There's a part of us that we want to keep pressing in. There's a part of us that, I don't know about you, but it takes me a while to warm up. If I go to the, to the workplace, my muscles are cold. And I know you're supposed to do stretches, and yeah, at my age, you know, uh, and, and warm up your muscles. I mean, I can have a few pains. And, uh, Monies are the worst, but uh, getting going again, getting in motion. And I had some pains, the pains left because you begin to loosen up. And spiritual muscles can get cold if we're not working them. And so when I talk about spiritual muscle, it's that part of our our spiritual life that needs to engage in our heart toward the Lord and sometimes praising God, even when it sounds terrible. You can do it all by yourself. <laughs> you, you, it's, it's, if, it's, if it's close to singing, if it's a joyful noise, it, it, it's, it's in. God accepts it because he sees your heart. He hears your heart. 
Are you tracking with me? Consider it all joy. I've never been the one to say, oh, I got a flat tire, I'm jumping up and down. I have struggled with that. <laughs> but there's something about, don't let it get just a, don't let it, you know, ruin you. Don't let it ruin you. By now, it's like, by now, these things ought not to bother me as much in our spiritual life. But lo and behold, God is always working on us. And he knows what we need to get our attention. And so my perspective is this, should be this. When I encounter a trial, okay, Lord, this is not my problem. This is your problem. Really, when you think about it, what are you going to do, Lord? How are you going to get me through this? Perspective. Perhaps an opportunity for the Lord to intervene. How many like miracles? You know? Well, there has to be something there that's really a miracle. Perspective. Some little insight. To work something in our hearts and lives that would not otherwise be worked into. My, uh, my perspective sometimes is short-sighted. Why now, Lord? What good is this? Is there, what's the use of this? Why? After all they've served, you know, you, you start to think in the natural. Jesus, we read it in Hebrews, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Jesus was looking past the cross into all eternity, all those who will come because of the cross. If it takes hard trials, to get me to where I should be, then so be it. That's a hard prayer to pray. Remember when we used to sing the old hymn, Deeper, Deeper. You know what? Yeah. yeah. Even if it cost us hard trials, right? Deeper, let me go. Higher, higher. Sometimes we sing that without thinking really what we're singing. Uh, deeper, deeper, even though it causes hard trials. Right? I have a hard time preaching on trials because the Lord, as soon as I preach on trials, that's what I'm going to get. Lord, you know, you know my heart. But it's necessary if it Necessary, indeed it is. It says in another place. I think it's First Peter. If necessary. Second point is perfect result. Verse 4. Perfect result. Let endurance have its perfect result. What do you mean? Oh, endurance. Oh, what's endurance? Oh, endurance is being able to stand under pressure, bear the load, endure patience, long-suffering, understanding. What is it the Lord says we need to work on? 
I learned I don't like to pray for patience. You know how he's going to deal with that, right? He's going to test you. But Lord, help me to be patient. Jesus was the greatest example of endurance. And he could have called a host of angels to deliver him. Even prior to the cross, When he stood before Pilate, and Pilate asked him questions like, Who are you? And do you say you're the king? And Jesus would say a couple of words. He kept himself in submission. Perfect result that you may be perfect and complete. And no man can be perfect. What he's describing is this level of relationship that you are attached. You are abiding in the one who is perfect. He's perfect, and he makes you perfect through him. He's perfect. I'm imperfect. But because I trust in him, because he even enabled me to understand my need for him, I made complete. Now, if I were to ask you, what is, it you, what is your greatest need? What is your greatest need? We might come up with a variety of answers. But my greatest need, I believe the Bible teaches, is that we might know him. That we might hear his voice that we might discern what is going on in your situation, in the spirit realm, in the things that are happening around us in the earth. That is the last days and the events that are going to take place. May we have an understanding, as it was in the days of, even of Daniel, that they understood the times that they lived in. That even in Daniel's day, the three Hebrew children had the boldness to not bow before another god, and they had the boldness to pray this prayer. Even if our God does not deliver me, we will not bow down. And even if this costs me hard trials, Lord, help me to not cave in, but to reach up. I believe the Lord gives us the strength when we need it. We can fret and worry, and I can, I can get all bothered by how's this all going to work out. I can start to make my plans and try to project this timeline and all this on and on and go, but really what I need is just the calmness and the sensitivity of the leading in the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. What is going to make the difference in our world, in our community, in our homes, in our lives, is people see Jesus and are drawn to Jesus and not our own. And we can help lead the way. Some of the strongest peop people, testimonies, you may wonder how they could ever, people that have been used by God with, Severe disabilities. I can't remember his name, but it was a man that used to preach from in Alexandria. He, he, he couldn't walk. I don't know if he even had any legs, but he preached the gospel. 
There's just so many ways God uses in our weaknesses to work out his, his perfection, to work out his will and his glory. I wanted to turn to 2 Corinthians just for a moment, a few verses of Paul's life. Paul was a man of God who was not always a man of God. He was on the other side for a while, thought he was doing service for the Lord until he met Jesus. And even Paul, as much as he was turned around and as much fire and fervor as he had for the Lord, God says something to Paul that's very interesting and found in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, beginning there. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there's given me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to buffet me to keep me from exalting. We don't know exactly what it was. It could have been a physical thing. Some, feet, some believe it was his eyes. But notice to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I treated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient to you. The power is perfected in weaknesses. What God is saying to us is that you have a weakness, it's okay. Yes, I can heal those weaknesses. Yes, I can miraculously do things. But at the same time, if I choose not to, I have a purpose that is beyond your understanding. I have a purpose in mind that is to keep you unto myself, to keep you from going the way of the world which would want to elevate oneself. I believe all my heart Jesus heals. I believe in all my heart that he wants to heal. There are some cases where we say, why God? Why God? What is the purpose? And we have to leave it, leave it in the hands of God. And we're, we're able to have peace because it's his, his work. It's just like getting people to accept Christ. It's not our job to get them uh, necessary. We can't save anyone. We're just messengers. We're just in instruments, we're just trying to encourage someone else to take that step. It's God the Holy Spirit. And so, Paul goes on to say, my grace is sufficient for you, is Jesus. Power is perfected in weaknesses. Therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses how, how do you, I believe I'd rather listen to someone who has struggles than is perfect. I'd rather listen to someone who doesn't have it all together than one that's totally perfect, flawless. I, I, are you with me? But you can relate to that. Because in spite of the, of the weaknesses, in spite of, of the setbacks, in spite of all, if their heart is toward the Lord, then it's pointing the right direction. It's taking the eyes off oneself and pointing them to Jesus. Because everyone has to make that choice to experience Jesus. Let's move on. The third point, persevere. Don't quit. It's really what it's saying. Don't quit. Persevere. You ever felt like quitting? Come on. Don't quit on me now. 
A perseverance, pressing through. Don't stop believing. Cling to Him all the more that the love that is in your heart grow even deeper. If someone has hurt you, you can take that pain to the Lord. And let him carry you. There's a part that we'll never understand in this life totally. Well, God uses pain and suffering to further his kingdom. The early church experienced setback after setback persecution, trying to get these guys to shut up. They put them in prison. They put them in stocks. They threw stones. Yet the gospel was proclaimed unashamedly. And you'll read in the book of Acts what the early disciples rejoiced when they were persecuted for his name's sake. Unbelievable. They said we were considered worthy of suffering. Acts 5.41. They went from their way in the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy. What a different perspective. <laughs> and we live in an entitlement, entitlement. On, you know, we have our rights. <laughs> we live in that kind of a world. Jesus gave his life, showed the way by giving his life over so that others could be saved. There are trials that young people face today, and there are trials that middle-aged people face today. And there are trials that senior citizens and older folks try face. You never stop. It starts in your, as a child. You have trials, trials, but you, the, the prayer is, may I grow through my trials. I don't know who I was talking to. Somebody that was up there in years. And he said something like this, you know, it's a tough season in my life. I've outlived most of my friends. In fact, he probably, they probably outlived all the friends that they could remember and their family. Folks like that are going through trials, loneliness. It happens. Those of you who have lost uh, mates, and that's a trial. That's something very real. And through it all, the Lord is saying, I'm not going to leave you. Keep persevering. Keep believing. I am coming for you someday. And there will be a wonderful reunion that waits above. Consider it all joy. When you encounter various trials, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be complete. Whatever we need today, it all boils down to one person who we need today in our trial. And who understands more than anyone else is Jesus Christ our Lord. He understands what it's like to be rejected and to be not accepted. But he's there because his love 
goes out toward us. I thought we could sing a song in closing called The Edge of Heaven, a simple little song that describes how we now are going through things, but the day is going to come when all heaven is going to be revealed.